Chapter 19 covers diseases of the gastrointestinal and genitourinary systems. So in this chapter, we're going to be talking about some general classifications of diseases related to both systems, and we will talk about the pathogens associated with diseases of those systems, and then we will finish up uh, with a discussion regarding the consequences of untreated sexually transmitted diseases. As we discussed in chapter 16 about the importance of bowel technique, a similar situation can occur when we are performing a hysterectomy. Because the cervix extends down into the vaginal canal, that area is considered not sterile, but the inside of the abdomen is considered sterile. So from a surge tech perspective, we have to have an understanding of the um, areas of the body that are considered unsterile. So when we are doing procedures, we can make sure that we eliminate those instruments. So for example, with the hysterectomy, there is a special suture uh, um, scissor that we use called the Jorgensen's and it has a very uh, tight curve on the end. And that scissor is used to cut the paracervical fascia and it extends into the vaginal canal when it does that cutting. And so that scissor would need to be um, isolated from the rest of our instruments. So I think this is gonna help connect some of the dots regarding those things for us um, as far as additional applicability to the surgical aspect of things. If you remember back to our time spent in anatomy and physiology, we talked about the GI tract being an open hollow tube that begins at the mouth and terminates at the anus. We've also discussed at length that there are normal commensal microbes that live in this GI tract and there are also transient microbes that we ingest from our food and fluids. Now there's a, a, a an acid, hydrochloric acid in our stomach that helps to keep these transient microbes in check as well as enzymes in our mouth that help as well. But sometimes things get out of whack um, and that can happen due to a high alcohol consumption that can actually kill off the normal flora of our GI tract and an increased intake of sugar is going to feed those pathogenic microbes as well as feed the, the commensal ones that live there. So that can kind of upset the apple cart and change the balance of things. Um, also being on antibiotics. Antibiotics hopefully will eliminate the pathogen, but they can also eliminate the normal flora that's there as well. And then those pathogens have a better chance of proliferating. Most of the intestinal flora are obligate anaerobes and consist primarily of bacteroides and fusobacterium, but then we have our facultative anaerobes like our E. coli, our enterobacter, our proteus, and our klebsiella. Now, anytime these normal microbes get outside of that tract, then that means that they can take the opportunity to proliferate and become pathogenic and cause us harm. Large amounts of bacteria in the mouth can lead to tooth decay, periodontitis, and periodontonium. And the most common one that causes um, tooth decay and gum disease is Streptococcus mutans. It has this ability to create these polymicrobial biofilms and then they kind of get into the cracks and crevices of the teeth where the normal mechanical chewing and movement of the mouth um, 
is unable to kind of break them loose. And so they can then cause uh, tooth decay, infections of the gums called gingivitis. Uh, and uh, also periodontitis. And with periodontitis, we get these pockets of pus that form around the teeth and can eventually destroy the surrounding tissues and bone as well, which is uh, primarily caused by Porphyromonas gingivalis. Fusobacterium and treponema can also cause something that we refer to as acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, ANUG. It's also non-clinical term is trench mouth. And this can cause bleeding pain and difficulty with chewing, which is also referred to as Vincent's angina or Vincent's infection. It is non-contagious and we clinically we refer to it as periodontonium. It causes ulcerations and necrosis of the gum and tissue, and it results in crater-like defects that you see here in the bottom image. Overall, these bacteria produce lactic acid, and lactic acid is what facilitates uh, the erosion of the tooth enamel and the tissue, and perhaps eventually the bone. Um, the Fusobacterium and Treponema, they also release endotoxins that are secondary to poor oral hygiene and also um, malnutrition can contribute to diseases uh, like periodontonium. we're going to quickly review some bacteria that we've already talked about before and the first one on the list is uh, and it's not listed on this slide is H. pylori. Remember um, H. pylori can lead to peptic ulcers however it's not really the H. pylori that they blame for it but the inflammation that is caused by the H. pylori actually is what leads to the ulcers themselves. But H. pylori has the ability to, to neutralize gastric acidity, and that is how it, it survives. It will infiltrate the mucous uh, membrane and kind of hang out there, and the immune system can't penetrate the mucous membrane. So it kind of hangs out there um, along the mucous membrane, causing inflammation, which is what is believed to lead to the peptic ulcers. Can also um, slowly lead to chronic gastritis, atrophic gastritis, intestinal metaplasia, and eventually can result in gastric adenocarcinoma. Campylobacter jejuni is the most common um, bacteria that causes GI disease in the um, Campylobacter family. It uh, is referred to as Campylobacteriosis. And uh, it primarily causes diarrhea, um, and it is the leading cause of gastroenteritis worldwide. It's a zoonotic disease, so remember that means that it's transferred from humans by animals or animal products, um, more specifically eating raw or undercooked meats or unpasteurized milk or drinking contaminated water. Uh, it can also be a way that it's transmitted and the way that we protect ourselves from it is making sure that we cook our food properly and pasteurize our milk properly. Now Clostridium, Clostridium difficile, we've talked about that before. Um, the CDC has uh, C. diff at the top of their antibiotic antimicrobial resistance urgent threat list as of 2013. Um, the current estimates are about 250,000 infections annually, resulting in about 14,000 
deaths. And remember that C. diff is considered exclusively a healthcare associated infection and typically only found in individuals who have had antibiotic therapy, uh, long term treatments with antibiotic therapy. E. coli. We know E. coli lives in the GI tract. It's a commensal. It is commonly blamed for urinary tract infections, sepsis, diarrheal disease, and neonatal meningitis. Those that are immunocompromised are at a higher risk. And there's five different types, and I'm just going to go through them quickly. Um, the first one is enteropathogenic or EPEC, and it is the causative agent of diarrheal disease outbreaks in nurseries predominantly. Um, commonly, uh, another one that's commonly known is called enterotoxigenic E. coli. And that is also referred to as traveler's diarrhea. And the, this strain of E. coli secretes exotoxins, and that's what's responsible for producing diarrhea. In severe cases, they are going to provide antibiotic therapy, but in all of these situations, you're going to see a commonality is diarrhea leads to dehydration. So rehydrating the patient is really one of the most important things that, that they would need to do. Individuals who live in countries where this enterotoxigenic E. coli is prevalent will often have protective antibodies against the toxins, but if you don't live there and you go there and you drink their water, let's say, you could end up getting sick from that. It's typically known to cause bloody diarrhea. Um, So moving on to our next one, enterohemorrhagic E. coli. Um, this strain of E. coli causes disease by making a toxin called shigatoxin, and uh, it also causes bloody diarrhea. The toxins that are responsible are referred to as verotoxins, and their job is to destroy endothelial cells that line the inner layer of the blood vessels, and that's how they cause hemorrhages. Individuals that are infected by this strain of E. coli can also develop something called hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS, which involves thrombocytopenia, acute renal failure, and hemolytic anemia. These individuals are most likely going to need hemodialysis as well as blood transfusions. This uh, hemorrhagic type of E. coli is found typically in the intestines of healthy cattle. And then when the meat is processed, it, the meat can get contaminated with this hemorrhagic strain. So again, making sure that we cook our meat well and that we pasteurize our milk properly. It can also be passed person to person in families um, and in daycare centers and swimming in or drinking sewage contaminated water can also be a route of transmission. Uh, another strain of E. coli is referred to as enteroaggregative, and it has become recognized as a cause of diarrhea in children in developing and industrialized countries. It presents with persistent diarrhea, and it is the major cause of illness and death in, in regards to looking at these strains of E. coli overall. The last type is enteroinvasive E. coli, and that strain causes a type of dysentery that's similar to shigellosis, but it's not as virulent. And again, children are the most susceptible, but it is also common among travelers. As far as diagnosis and treatment of these diseases caused by E. coli, detecting it in the stool is key, and then giving replacement fluids to combat dehydration, and then additionally antibiotics as needed. Now, Shigella infections 
um, are also known as bacillary dysentery. And these bacteria affect the lining of the small and large intestines. They do cause bloody diarrhea, pus, nausea, vomiting, fever, and convulsions. They also produce uh, the same type of shiga toxins that are produced by E. coli. And uh, there's a really low infectivity dose, which means uh, we only need a small few of bacteria to be able to cause the disease, 10 in this case with Shigella infections, um, as opposed to um, 100, 200, 200 organisms of other types of um, bacteria that produce these types of infections. Humans are the natural reservoirs for Shigella and we can get it by eating food that's been contaminated with it. Salmonella infections, most common cause of enterocolitis and salmonella lives in the intestines of humans and the intestines of other animals and uh, typically the cases are mild or undiagnosed. So uh, statistics show there's about 42,000 cases in the US annually, but they think it's more than that because they typically go undiagnosed or you know, people don't go into the hospital when they're sick with it or see their doctor or whatever. Botulism, botulism we've talked about before, Clostridium botulinum. It's found in soil and in improperly canned foods. And um, after it's been ingested in the GI system, it produces a, a toxin and uh, that gets absorbed into the bloodstream. And that um, makes its way to the nervous system and blocks the neural transmission of peripheral nerve synapses. So we get weak muscles with that, right? Because we're blocking the, the, the transmission of that signal, right? So we get something called flaccid paralysis and uh, intubation is usually required so that we can breathe for that individual. Yersinia, Yersinia causes yersiniosis, and um, that manifests itself again as severe diarrhea with necrosis of the Peyer's patches. And uh, Yersinia enterolytica is probably the most the most virulent one, and it's going to cause diarrhea, vomiting, fever, abdominal pain, and a lot of times uh, diseases by Yersinia are misdiagnosed as either appendicitis or Crohn's disease or something else because they have that lower abdominal pain that we usually associate with something either going wrong with the, the intestine or the appendix. Typically, diagnosis is made by isolating it from patients' feces, blood, or vomit. And there are two different, uh, two other, um, there's one other type besides the enterolytica, which is pseudotuberculosis, which um, if somebody is infected with that, it could lead to intestinal resection. Vibrio disease, uh, the most common one here is cholera. Uh, it's the most threatening to humans. There have been seven documented pandemic outbreaks of cholera since 1817. And uh, this bacteria gets its virulence factor from the uh, endotoxins uh, that it secretes. The route of transmission is typically the fecal to oral route. And those that are infected typically don't display any symptoms, but those with compromised immune systems are going to be those that are at the highest risk. Uh, symptoms include diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal cramping, hypotension, tachycardia, restlessness, dry mucous membranes, and loss of skin elasticity. Again, severe dehydration occurring with this as well. And then lastly, our bacterioides infections. We've talked about this already, but Bacterioides, remember, are commensals in the GI tract, so they're typically not going to give us any problem unless there's some sort of breach 
in the GI tract itself. And then these will be allowed to spill out into the surrounding tissues and that's when they can wreak havoc. Um, some examples would be gastrointestinal surgery, perforated appendix, perforated intestinal ulcer, blunt or sharp trauma, diverticulitis, and or inflammatory bowel disease. So after the intestinal wall has been compromised, then these little guys are gonna make their way into the peritoneal cavity. And uh, they work in synergism with each other. So E. coli is an aerobic bacteria and it once it uses up all of the oxygen, then the the anaerobic bacteria, such as Bacterioides fragilis, um, is going to then kind of take over the business, right? Um, so this can lead to abscess formation, resistance to phagocytosis, and inactivation of antibiotics. And the way that we treat this is typically with an incision and drainage. We're going to have to go in there and clean out the abscess or uh, wash out the abdomen. There are many species of protozoa and worms that can enter the intestinal tract and cause disease. Typically, these are acquired through the fecal oral route. Different types of larvae can incubate in, uh, outside of the host, and then once they're ingested through contaminated food, then they become active. Some can actually penetrate through the skin and make their way to the intestine through various routes. Uh, animals that are infected with worms can be eaten, and then that will infect the host. Amoeba, Intel amoeba histolytica, Giardia lamblica, and Cryptosporidium parvum are the most common ones, and these can cause um, severe to mild diarrhea and inflammation. Similar to the GI tract, the genitourinary system, or GU, sometimes it's abbreviated as, has a bunch of opportunistic residents uh, that take up shop there. Uh, for example, parasites. Uh, one common example is Trichomonas vaginalis. Fungal infections can also be caused by Candida albicans and Cryptococcus neoformans. Bacterial diseases of the genitourinary system include chlamydia, UTI, vaginosis, cankers, gonorrhea, and syphilis. Pretty much talked about all of these already. Um, so briefly, um, a review, chlamydia trachomatis um, can lead to pelvic inflammatory disease um, and ectopic pregnancy due to the blockage of the fallopian tubes. Uh, it can also be passed on to the fetus and result, uh, manifest itself in the fetus as uh, conjunctivitis or pneumonia. E. coli, uh, largely responsible for UTI infections. If uh, a UTI goes untreated, it can also affect the kidneys and cause severe infection in the kidney called uh, pyelonephritis or nephropathogenic uh, E. coli. Uh, is a special strain that has a capsule that adds to its virulence. Those that have UTIs or typically complain of flank pain that radiates to the back, dysuria, frequent urination, and hematuria. And typically, we can take care of this with a course of antibiotics. Gardnerella vaginalis causes something called vaginosis, and because there isn't any inflammation, they do not refer to it as vaginitis. Typically, uh, this bacteria is part of the normal microbiome of, uh, the, of the vagina in about 50 to 70% of healthy females. 
Uh, it is characterized by an increase in pH in the vagina and also a reduction in the um, commensal microbe lactobacilli. It can be transmitted sexually, um, but has been known to occur in females who are not sexually active. Males typically don't have symptoms, but can contribute to reoccurring infections in males. Sometimes uh, if there are symptoms present, that could include a foul smelling discharge. And um, invasive procedures such as hysterectomies, biopsies, change in sexual partners, menopause, diabetes, and uh, immunocompromised individuals, and then poor hygiene can also increase the risk of uh, getting vaginosis. Hemophilus ducreae, remember that causes cankers, and that is a sexually transmitted disease. Neisseria gonorrhoeae, we talked about that before. It ha has similar risk uh, as chlamydia and can lead to PID or ectopic pregnancy. Can also increase the chance of miscarriage, preterm labor, rupture of membranes, and pass the infection can be passed on to the baby. Uh, during vaginal delivery, can also render men sterile and or block the structures of the testicles, either fully or partially. Treponema pallidum, remember that is the causative agent of venereal syphilis. And um, uh, aside from infections involving the genitourinary system, it can also include lesions that appear on the skin that are nowhere near the genitalia. Pregnant women can also pass this on to their baby, and it can potentially result in miscarriage or severe birth defects. Human papillomavirus is the um, most common virus that affects the genitourinary system. And uh, there are several strains of it that have been identified. And the CDC indicates that nearly all sexually active men and women will become infected with HPV at some time during their lives. Signs and symptoms, if there are signs and symptoms, might include um, lesions that develop, cancer of the cervix, vulva, penis, anus, or oropharynx. There is a vaccination for prevention uh, for preteen pre boys and girls. Uh, HPV can also cause condyloma, which are more commonly known as genital warts, and these are referred to as sexually transmitted infections also caused by the human papillomavirus and found in the perineal region. So these appear as small, flat uh, lesions with little or no symptoms, or can progress to large dry growths that resemble cauliflower or condylomata acuminata. And then they can spread throughout the genitalia um, uh, to the anus and up to the suprapubic region, which would be uh, a few inches below the belly button there. Humans are carriers and reservoirs for these HPV infections and they pass them between partners. Um, the condyloma can also be treated surgically. We can bring them into the OR and use cautery or laser to remove the lesions. Urinary tract infections are categorized as either upper or lower urinary tract infections, and then they are further characterized into complicated versus uncomplicated urinary tract infections. So upper UTIs include ureter infection and kidney infection, while lower UTIs include the urethra and the bladder. Acute lower UTIs can cause pain when urinating, um, a feeling of urgency to urinate, and increased frequency of urination. 
the urine is going to appear cloudy due to the presence of pus, bacteria, and uh, white blood cells. Upper UTIs um, are distinguished from lower UTIs by examining the urine directly from the ureter, and this is done via catheterization. These individuals are said to have poly, uh, polyonephritis, and they can also have a fever. These, um, if these infections are recurrent, then that could damage the kidney and that could result in renal failure or hypertension. Complicated UTIs are ones in which the patient has trouble with normal urination, and this is typically due to mechanical or neurological problems that are related to the infection or a result of the infection. They're often caused by those that have indwelling catheters for long periods of time. And this just acts as a pathway for the bacteria to enter into the urinary tract. Oftentimes, these are resistant to many types of antibiotics, and uh, as a result, complicated UTIs are very difficult to treat. Uncomplicated UTIs are typically seen in sexually active women, um, and they don't, it doesn't really interfere with urination, and typically they respond well to antibiotic treatment unlike the complicated urinary tract infections. Cystitis is a word that we use to um, refer to bladder infections, and this is due to bacteria entering the urethra uh, and then entering the bladder. Typically, this happens in females more than males just because the female urethra is a lot shorter than the male urethra. If we are going to see these bladder infections, a common causative agent is the enterococcus species. Uh, and then also uh, the E. coli is going to be our, our culprit most of the time. Again, the Situations that predispose patients to cystitis are uh, urinary catheters. Something else that can cause cystitis is uh, not emptying the bladder all the way. If there is a residual of urine that's more than three milliliters, that can cause an infection. Uh, the way that we determine if this is happening is by doing something called a cystogram and this is where they'll have you come in and drink a bunch of water and fill up your bladder and then they're going to take uh, maybe an ultrasound of the bladder while it's full then they're going to have you urinate and come back and take some more images of it to see if there's any residual urine that is still left in the bladder. Uh, cystitis can also be accompanied by blood in the urine or hematuria, um, but that can also be associated with other things like bacterial endocarditis or renal trauma or stones or if there's some sort of cancerous tumor there as well. Uh, and then lastly, uh, pyelonephritis is that kidney infection that we were talking about. So uh, essentially, bacteria can enter the urethra, track up into the bladder, track up the ureter, and into the kidney, right, where it can uh, eventually, if it's not treated, get into the bloodstream and cause septicemia. Uh, individuals with pyelonephritis typically complain of back pain, fever, and also lower UTI symptoms like that frequency to urinate, uh, feeling of urgency to urinate, and painful urination as well. Pyelonephritis is considered life-threatening, and so typically they're going to treat it with an arsenal of antibiotics. This brings us to the end of our review regarding diseases of the GI and GU systems. I hope you found it to be helpful.